The Force Awakens tomorrow, a moment diehard Star Wars fans have been waiting a decade for. Remember that story showing people in L.A. camping out weeks in advance? Closer to home, some hit the theaters at 1 a.m. so they could start a marathon of all the Star Wars movies, culminating in the newest installment, which takes place 30 years after the last. You still with me? There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. There's a lot of excitement surrounding this one. I could make another force joke, but I'll resist the urge. Joining me now is one such person to prove he sent us some photos of his original Star Wars fan club newsletters from the 70s and 80s. Ethan Gilsdorf is a self-described journalist, memoirist, critic, poet, teacher, and 17th level geek. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see and, you, Jim. And GBH Arts editor Jared Bone, who saw the movie and thought, well, no, actually, you can tell us what you thought in a couple <laughs> seconds. I want to start with the reviews and then step back with the whole cultural phenomenon thing. But first, before I get your reviews, here's the governors today on Boston Public Radio. For me... First three, fabulous. Second three, no. <laughs> Message to everybody. I thought the next three were bad, <gasps> and so I am done with these things. He is done with these things. Should he be done with them, Ethan? He should not be done with them. Why not? Well, I think this new one redeems the franchise for all the people, certainly my generation, who were really disappointed by the substandard prequels that George Lucas you know, released. Don't give away the plot. Just tell us yeah. why it uh, redeems well, I, itself. Well, I think uh, you know, it's I think it's a well-made movie. I think it hits all the similar notes that the original trilogy did: Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. Its uh, action sequence are terrific. The story is great. It feels like going home. Now, for me, there's a dose of nostalgia that gets layered over this. For me, I was so turned off by the prequels that this just felt like okay, this second is the three. world. This is the world. Yeah, the second three. This is the world that I remember. Uh, a visceral, you know, immersive world, characters I can care about, um, not a ton of CGI, which was a huge, you know, important You read thing this me. guy? I am. I you am. are? I am. The, the great thing about this is that J.J. Abrams, who's taken over this franchise, first of all, you have to realize that he grew up with Spielberg, really, immersed, loved Spielberg's films, ultimately became friends with him. It was Spielberg who helped shepherd him to this project. He has complete reverence for the, the three original films that he's now succeeding mm -hmm. after Empire Strikes Back. Going back to, as Ethan was just saying, to, that it's not so CGI laden. You feel like you're back in this world. We're seeing characters who we've known for, what is it, nearly 40 years now. Han Solo, Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford are back. And it's so enjoyable to watch. And it's a good story. I think you're going to weep before he does. I'm <laughs> you wrote a great piece in the Globe the other day saying this is all generational. First trilogy was a 77, yep. second 95. So how you view this is in part a function of what generation you come from. Explain what you meant. Exactly. I mean, certainly both the age you were when you first saw the movies and which movies you saw them and kind of how you consumed Oh, and the order them. in which you saw yeah, them. The course, yeah, the order. So, you know, kids, for example, my nephews who were 8 and, you know, 12, you know, they could watch the prequel movies. They could watch them on their, you know, DVD. They can watch them in any order. I think for people who grew up with the original ones in the theater, you know, that was the foundation. And, and um, you know, for me, I was 11 when the first Star Wars movie came out. Completely blew my mind. And it was, you know, a cut above most of anything else like it out there at the time. Can I play the Charlie Bur uh, Baker skeptic role just for a second, even though I'm not authorized to do that? You know, the sense I get whenever there's a phenomenon like ever in society is, is it really the quality of the thing or is it just a club that everybody wants to belong to? Is there a little, you're shaking your head, is there not a little bit of the latter? Well, no, I think it's definitely a club, but I think it's a very uh, discriminating club. He could mm. not get away with making a bad movie here, especially after the, the reputation that George Lucas had was tainted for the prequel series that he Which that are he the made. second three, for those that don't know, the prequel came right. after the... Uh, okay. The ones are made in the late yeah. 90s, 2000. So, so he, yeah, no, he would not get away with making bad films here, and, and I think people people want goodness and and it, with social media now it would be this movie would be destroyed in a heartbeat okay, if so he had made anything you say the but. fans wouldn't have allowed it. let's take a look at some of the fans this is a fandango clip of a few mega star wars fans who were given well a little bit of a pop quiz here it is name one member of the star wars galactic senate massa Meda. yes one member of the u.s senate the u.s senate <laughs> name one member of the star wars galactic senate Bail Organa. Name one member of the U.S. Senate. Name one member of the Star Wars Galactic Senate. Queen Amidala. True. Name one member of the U.S. Senate. 
You know, I love when he asks about the Galactic Senate. They all look at him like, what an idiot are you? Of course I can name the members. So is, are, the, are the true fans, and I consider you amongst them, this is over-merchandised to absolute death. Does that, trouble, does that trouble you at all, or it doesn't diminish the whole thing? To me, it does, and I did a piece on Salon.com this week about this very issue, and I understand that these movie makers and Disney and Lucasfilm want to make their money back, and I know they want to you know, get their money's worth or get their return on their investment, but... They say 80% of the money they're going to make is not on the film itself, but on all the merchandising yeah, and stuff. Yeah, and it's insane, that the kinds of products. And I guess in the end, one expects this. The thing that I guess I got a little bit... Um, you know, nostalgic about was that, that that notion of going to the theater without any pre preconceptions of what the film was going to be like, and, and we're barraged with spoilers and clips and, and every pro possible product covered with girl makeup. You know, um, I saw a thing, uh, a product online from um, I think from France that was foie gras in a plastic tube branded with a Star Wars. It was fabulous. I know. tried it. Is there <laughs> been a I mean, movie guy? Has there been a phenomenon quite like this? that ever before? I mean, Certainly films have been hugely anticipated, but I don't think I can ever think of something that has been so anticipated, where you had people buying tickets this far in advance. Lord of the Rings, that was highly anticipated, the Hobbit movie, but, but not like this, where the ticket sales in advance of this blow out of the water half the films that came out this year. Is this gonna be the biggest, I mean, the biggest grossing films are the two James Cameron things. I think Avatar's right. one and it passed Titanic. Is this gonna be number one at the end of this thing? I, I have a pretty good feeling it will be. Yeah. yeah, how about you? Based on the reviews it's getting out, I say absolutely yes. Two really happy guys, Ethan Gilson. <laughs> it's great to see you, you, Jared, as well. Take care. You sound guys. like the new Darth Vader, by the way. <laughs>